Jessica Hunter from Adidas. I'm curious, and maybe Emily, this would be more for you. Have you looked at how equipment that's built around men's anthropometrics is affecting injury rates in women, particularly interested in running shoes? <laughs> Great question. Very direct question. Um, so we did, uh, in our initial list of topics, we talked about um, equipment, um, sports bras, um, different kind of more sex-specific equipment that female athletes face. I think the challenge with it, it actually didn't make the final cut, and I think partly it is so sport-specific. I think it's an important question and should be studied, but we just didn't have, because of our, our athlete population that we tried to sample, we just weren't able to get narrowed down enough to um, the sport specifics. But I think it's very important, especially shoe-related concerns. Agreed. <laughs> Hi, uh, Delaney Miller, PhD student at Stanford. Uh, so I was a former uh, cross country and track runner in college, and I feel like a lot of the red S problems on our team were related to psychological problems with disordered eating. I'm curious when you think about treatment for red S, like how much emphasis is placed on the psychological uh, portion of health versus on the physical? I'll take that one. So a lot. We have in our female athlete program an interdisciplinary team. Some of them are here today. So we really rely on our sports dietitians and our sports psychologists. I think so much of the psychology that's embedded in there is multifactorial and you have to get to the drive behind the disorder. Is this messaging from parents? Is it messaging about performance? Is it from the coach? Is it depression, anxiety? A lot of these athletes are A personalities, extremely bright, really motivated. Is it that they just got too far down a hole in terms of perfection. So all of those kind of personality traits and influences definitely need to be addressed in the treatment. Hi, uh, Amanda here, a PhD student at Stanford. And I guess my question is kind of like, with all this REDS research and implementing it, it seems easy to implement like diagnosis and teams and professional teams, but like how do you bring that accessibility to like amateur runners and amateur athletes that don't really know the symptoms and can't diagnose it themselves? And maybe these like athlete specific clinics aren't covered by insurance, aren't as accessible for the average person. Yeah, I think a lot about it uh, uh, um, is the accessibility of the messaging and having buy-in and, and changing sport culture over time. I think that's why partnering with um, race host organizations is a really great opportunity to bring it to the recreational runners um, and to get the message out there and kind of um, showing, uh, demonstrating the outcomes and the important impact on performance and well-being for our athletes is a great way to get buy-in from our community partner organizations. We're trying to develop more online tools as well. Mm -hmm. So we uh, put together a website, we're happy to have people add to it, um, called Red in Sport, so that people can find some information about it. And then, not to keep pitching the Female Athlete Conference, but I'll pitch the Female Athlete Conference. That is meant for the community, for athletes, for coaches, for providers. And we have a pre-clinic, a pre-conference session to really help people understand how to build a clinic. You know, when we started our clinic at Children's, I was a sports doctor without people that really knew how to treat this, and so I relied on therapists in the community and coaches who really understood it. And so you just have to start with where you're at and, and find the people that understand it and bring them in. Emily, how about adding a little bit more? I know yeah, you've done a yeah, lot of work I was about on to this. Jump campus. in. I didn't yeah, know if we had you. another, another thank 10 you. seconds. But I also think that education to coaches, education to parents, depending on where those athletes are in their training, we're seeing that's in the adolescent age with. So there are a lot of high school coaches that we can start to deliver this message to, and they can, even as part of their entry into that, that team or in that part start of the season, start to really present that information in a way where they have the resources, they have the toolkits through different websites, through this information. So it's not just, it's from the clinician, the coach, the parent, and the athlete. So everybody's empowered with this information. Thank you, great question. Hi, um, I'm new to this, and I think you partly got at this, but how do you know you're measuring everything you want to? Like, I didn't hear anything about inflammation or other stress markers that I thought would have been pretty integral to all this. So in our methods paper, we go through each topic and have evidence-based information saying what we know about how to measure them versus where things are still kind of open. So from immunology, I'd say that's probably 
our weakest area in terms of what are the best markers for it because we can see things like IL-6 going in different directions and which are the right things to use. Um, there's been some good omics work in that space as well. So some are more established and are li listed there as sort of gold measures that you should be using when you're using DEXA or when you're doing endocrine markers. Other things like GI and immunology need to be a little bit more developed, but they're all in that paper. Got it. Thanks. Hi, thank you for a wonderful panel of talks. I really enjoyed that. Uh, Gabriella from University of Oregon. This might be more directed to Emily. I was really intrigued to hear that you're looking at sort of what types of contraceptions that might be beneficial for different athletes. And I wanted to see if you could talk more to how why you're casting that net versus how personalized you're actually looking at the hormone profiles and what type of sports they're in versus individualized or precision medicine. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer that completely right now. But uh, I think that what I've been hearing a lot are these athletes that are on different, different types of hormonal contraception, whether it's birth control pill, intrauterine devices, other, other forms. They, they don't know how to um, better understand their body, understand their hormonal profile because their hormonal profile is different. There's going to be variability from athlete to athlete, but there is probably going to be some consistency from the different types of birth control. So if we can start to do more studies, and I think this is more of that research gap as far as the type of research studies looking at the different types of hormonal contraception and that athlete profile, I think we then can then provide guidance on, on fueling, on training, on recovery, and how that might be different. So I think it starts with studying the right population and having a good standardized approach, but then having that, that translational impact to for that for that individual athlete based on their hormonal profile. So a little bit of both. Hi, uh, Severin Ruiz, postdoc at UC San Diego. Um, I was wondering, like, as, as scientists, we always try to minimize noise in our data to be able to show important significances. And uh, looking at Dr. Blemker's data uh, about the normalized soleus and uh, psoas tissues, um, it was statistically significant, but at the same time, there was maybe one or two data points that were outside the range of the other sex. And then I guess the question is like, how much does it really matter? Or would this be a good example of where we, where we should say as scientists, let's, let's pool the data. Um, because if we can see differences, like, <clears throat> it, should we appreciate the noise basically? And, and it's maybe a bit harder to find significant differences, but is it like more real world? I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure if I if I ask my question the right way. Um, I think I understand your question. It's a good question. Um, that isn't a complete like. That's kind of not complete because you need a fair amount, I think, to really fully appreciate the differences. Um, it's part of our goal in this project is actually to not only just give like average numbers, but give a range. Um, so that people in, in modeling could actually do more better uncertainty quantification and understand, like, you know, if you're trying to scale a model of a female in this particular um, body dimensions, here are, here's like the average, but here's the range also. Um, I think that would be extremely valuable. So, I mean, I don't know, what, I don't know if it's Im functionally important, but I think it's um, different enough that it's probably worth pursuing to see if it is. That makes sense. Let's go here, here, and sure. then I think we're okay. We're one more. All Mary right. Buckstein from it. Harvard Medical School. So first of all, thank all of you. Very inspiring, and also always depressing at the beginning to see how little research is done in female athletes. So this is for Dr. Blemker. My lab also does um, musculoskeletal modeling, and also for the community who does that. Let's not forget about the trunk. So everybody's yes. doing lower extremity models and running, and everybody has back pain. And a lot of women have vertebral fractures. And so we have developed male and female musculoskeletal models of the trunk and the thoracal lumbar spine based on population-based data from the Framingham Heart Study. So there's data out there, not just in healthy volunteers who come to the lab, but we can get medical imaging data from population-based cohorts where there's huge variability. So we have a set of 400 subject-specific musculoskeletal models that are on the OpenSim website. So I'd encourage our colleagues to, you know, go out there, the data is there from these imaging studies that we can incorporate into the musculoskeletal modeling, both sex-specific and age-specific. 
because I think we can't also just look at the young, healthy population. We have to, to our ageism, um, colleagues, look at those of us who are older than 55. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, I'm getting the hook from the back of the room. So big thank you to our panel today. It was an awesome session.